Hello, uh, my name is Fazan Kadri, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board, or SAB as it's called, is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming and spending an afternoon with us. Before I start, uh, Sarah, I told you I'd do this. Uh, folks who are watching uh, at the live stream, if you have questions, please send them to dolequestions, that's one word, dolequestions, at ku.edu. And I'll, I'll mention it again, I promise. So, ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, my friend Chris and I were in this very room talking about what was a, a four-month-old war. And 16 months later, the war grinds on. And what I suggest that we've all seen is what we've seen in history before, the ebb and the flow of war. Uh, Chris and I chose our title of High Tech, the Drones, High Tech, and Trenches because that's what we've seen. We've seen the use of, of drones, armed drones, uh, to drop bombs, deliver precision munitions, uh, conduct reconnaissance, uh, change uh, some facet of warfare. Uh, we've seen the high-tech weapon systems, the, the, the high Mars rockets that the U.S. has uh, provided the Ukrainians, French artillery, German artillery, uh, British artillery, British systems that are coming in, the storm shadow, uh, long range, uh, not hypersonic, but a, a long range cruise missile that can be launched from the air. Uh, the introduction of Western tanks and the training programs that have gone along to bring up uh, new, this new equipment to the Ukrainians. Uh, the promise of M1A1s uh, once they come off the, the factory line sometime next year and now the approval to offer them the Ukrainians F-16s. The Russians have continued to change the way they fight. You know, they are learning. Uh, you know, anyone who thinks that the Russians are inept you know, hasn't studied war. Uh, they are learning too to use drones to identify Ukrainian targets, to fire at those targets uh, with a, uh, sometimes up to just a single cannon firing five rounds. And then that artillery piece drives away really quickly to avoid the counterfire. This is the ebb and flow of warfare. Uh, shortly after we met last year, the Ukrainians launched a very successful counteroffensive. They recaptured or liberated uh, tens of uh, thousands of kilometers of their own country from the Russians. And they avoided culminating, going beyond where they could reasonably stop. And the war settled down to what warfare that my grandfather would have recognized because he fought in World War I and the trenches that we've seen. And so warfare's ebb and flow came back to soldiers in the mud and the grinding nature of this kind of warfare in the 21st century. I'm sure we've all seen uh, on TV or listened to pundits talk about the city of Bakhmut. 
And, you know, Bakhmut, we've all been told, has no strategic importance. And I frankly disagree. Bakhmut, that city in Ukraine, became very important to the Russians because it became important to their president. Uh, and Mr. Putin has to have that victory. And so the Russians committed forces upon forces upon forces. And because the Russians made that commitment, President Zelensky had to commit forces. This, I think, historians will realize this is the Verdun of this war. It is a grinding, grinding fight. Uh, I read recently that there's an estimate that the Russians have suffered 20,000 killed in the fight in Bakhmut. And that's 5,000 more killed than they lost in nine years in Afghanistan when they were there. If the ratio of wounded to dead is, as I learned as a student long ago, is three to one, you know, so we're talking 80,000 casualties just on the side of the Russians. Don't really know how many soldiers the Ukrainians have lost, but I would imagine, even though they were defending, that they lost at least an appreciable amount. I also think, and this is just Kevin Benson, I also think that one of the things that they did, they, the Ukrainians, did, they took advantage of the focus that the Russians made on Bakhmut. And brigades were taken off the line and were training on the use of the British challengers and the British uh, chi uh, warrior infantry fighting vehicle, the German Leopards and the Martyr infantry fighting vehicle. Uh, and the French tanks that were sent. And soon there'll be American M1A1 Abrams along with the Bradleys that are already there because you can't just snap your fingers and forces are trained when you're introducing new systems. Uh, last year's counteroffensive was done with the same equipment that the Russians had been using. You know, the T-72s, T-80s, uh, the 152 millimeter artillery and so on. Next step, maybe it started today, we'll see the effect of Western weapons in Ukrainian hands against the Russians. Don't know. But both sides have been learning, as we said, the ebb and the flow of warfare. High-tech drones and trenches. Last year, we showed a short video about the, you know, the very f fun rap song that some Ura a Ukrainian uh, made, Bayraktar, and the amazing effect that that Turkish drone delivering precision munitions had on the long columns of Russian tanks. Haven't heard much about Bayraktar of late because one of the things that happens in war and the conduct of warfare is people learn and the electronic warfare that goes on and the jamming of the signals that guide these drones. And so the higher altitude ones are driven lower and lower, which means they come within range of anti-aircraft gunfire and missiles. And then there's a countermeasure to the countermeasure and it goes on and on and on. This is what we are seeing. Uh, what else? Uh, Chris and I were talking a little earlier about uh, the handful of American factories that can make just the so-called dumb 150, 155 millimeter artillery shells. Uh, on average, the United States produces 15,000 shells a year. The Germans have a couple of factories that make dumb 155 rounds. They can produce 15,000 a year, public information from newspapers. There are days when the Ukrainians fire 30,000 a day. So what are we all learning? We're learning that, boy, maybe we better relook at some of our industrial policies. Maybe we need to see what the depth of our magazines, as, it, as the term has come about, need to be if we are truly going to look globally, we the United States, what would it take if the People's Liberation Army tries to invade Taiwan? 
how much magazine depth are we going to need? What can we draw from the Russia-Ukraine war? And how ready do we need to be? And it goes, ebb and flow of warfare. The lines settle down in trenches. The Russians have resorted to firing missiles and drones uh, and rockets. Uh, I read in the New York Times, take it for what it's worth, uh, 15,000 rockets, missiles, and drones since about March of last year. Day after day after day. That means that the people in Kyiv go to sleep listening to air raid sirens. They wake up listening to air raid sirens. It happens during the middle of the night. The effect then is psychological. Maybe it's hardening the will that we're going to take this. We're not going to get knocked out. And it also reduces the amount of ammunition that the Ukrainians have to fire back at these missiles. From, again, open reports, they've been very effective at shooting down these rockets, missiles, and drones. But when they get through, we've all seen the effect. There was one of the photos that you saw of the four guys on a stretcher carrying a, a wounded pregnant woman from the wreckage of a children's hospital. Uh, that, too, is the ebb and flow of warfare. <coughs> Pardon me. That's what we're seeing uh, today, I guess. Maybe the, Russia, maybe the Ukrainian offensive that we've heard about and heard about and heard about is going, has started. Maybe it has. Don't know. Uh, I know from all of my studies, and, some, and I know that my friends in the audience who have also studied war know that the advantage of the offensive is the, the folks on the offensive pick the time and the date and the place, and they don't advertise when that happens. It happens when they choose, and that is the disadvantage that the defender has. The defender can't be strong everywhere, so the defender has to pick some places too. That's what's been going on, I think, uh, the military term is a shaping operation. Uh, get the enemy to look in different places. The drone attacks on Moscow. Uh, did they do much? From all reports, no, not really. But what effect did it have? You know, one of the things I read was the taxi cab drivers in Moscow were really upset because all their satellite access for their, for their GPS so they can get around the city was cut off in the hopes of disrupting the links for incoming Ukrainian drones. But the Ukrainians say that's not them. There's the other ebb and flow of warfare. What happens in the information area? You know, we see what the Ukrainians let us see. We see what the Russians let us see. We only, so we're dependent on the sources as well as what CNN can find, what Fox, what Sky Network, what the BBC can find. Uh, but that's part of the war, too, the battle of the narrative. Uh, shooting at this hospital is a war crime. Well, if you weren't defending from the hospital, we wouldn't shoot at the hospital. So the war crime is on your, f is on your fault. Okay? The ebb and the flow of warfare. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, as long as the war continues, attitudes are going to get harder and harder and harder. One of the photos that we, we showed that I found was uh, President Zelensky holding the colors, the flag of a Ukrainian battalion or brigade, and the commander kneeling and kissing the flag, swearing to God to defend his country. When we start talking about God and you know, the, the video that was released of the Ukrainian soldiers saying we're going to attack and kill the men who raped our sisters and killed our brothers, our attitudes are hardening. Uh, the Russians are saying similar things. 
There is no Ukraine. This is one Russia. How do we bring people like that to the negotiating table is the challenge for all the diplomats that are involved, which is a part of the ebb and flow of warfare. And so, however this latest offensive ends, we're going to see an expenditure of high technology weapons. We're going to see the use of drones and manned aircraft. And at some point, it's going to stop and we'll go back to trenches and soldiers in the mud on both sides, the ebb and the flow of warfare. And so, for those who are watching live stream, again, if you have questions, please send them to dolequestions, one word, at ku.edu. Sir. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I've titled my discussion, Putin in Power, Putin at War. And I'm going to begin with the provocative statement that being at war is a natural state of affairs for a President Putin. And it's not something to be avoided for, by him, as it is for us in the West, where we view competition below the threshold of armed conflict as the level of the, the game of great power competition. Um, for Putin, military operations are just right up the ladder of escalation, but there's no tripwire, if you will. And therefore, we view February 24th of 2022, the date of the invasion, as a, a wire being tripped and war starting. Um, that war really started years earlier. You can just go back all the way to Putin being in power when he was named prime minister in August of 1999 under President Boris Yeltsin. Um, he was involved, let's say this, uh, there were attacks on city blocks inside of Russia that then led to the Second Chechen War. And the Second Chechen War began in the fall of 1999 and lasted easily to 2002 and the wrap-up operations to 2004. And it's something that was a natural state of affairs that, that for, for Putin. And I think he became um, comfortable with being at war with at, or employing war to achieve the objectives he has. Um, from 2007 in Estonia with the cyber attacks and the fomenting of ethnic tensions between the Russians that live in Estonia and the ethnic Russians that live there and the, the troubles that, that that caused to the year later in Georgia, the Russian-Georgian War of 2008 in August of that year. Um, and then there was a pause. And that pause was the period of what we call the New Look military reforms. It lasted from 2008 to 2012 or 13 depending on how you calculate it. And he reorganized the military, reorganized um, the leadership of the military, and stood up a Special Operations Forces Command, the KSSO. Well, this wasn't done for a deterrent fact, uh, effect. It was done for employment. He re-engaged in military operations shortly thereafter. Within one year of the military reforms being completed, he started to attack Ukraine with the Crimean War um, and the annexation of Crimea in February and March of 2014, and then the insurgency that began in the Donbass region of Ukraine. The region over here, we're, uh, it's on the map right there, it's perfect, Donbass, um, of Lugansk and Donetsk. And we know how that turned out, and we looked at that, I believe, as speaking on behalf of no one, just myself as an individual, um, at the National Defense University, but I do not speak on behalf of the National Defense University or the Department of Defense. But we as Americans, I think, looked at that as a um, unnatural state of affairs, and we're hoping things would settle down, cool down. Um, but 
while I was there in 2016 in Ukraine as part of the Ministry of Defense Advisors program to the Ukrainian military, the officers I was w working with were saying, no, 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 this is, this is like an operational pause. This is gonna continue. And, and they were right, they were absolutely right. And th those operations began probably in the summer of 2001, we could label as the starting point with, uh, the sh again, shaping operations, particularly in the uh, psychological space, with the narrative space of what is Russia and what are Ukrainians compared to Russians. And this idea of one, one nation, Ukrainians and Russians being of one nation as part of this narrative that, that Putin came up with and tried to project. And as Kevin mentioned, this is gonna be nearly impossible to try to carry through some type of one, one united nation um, after the, the raping and attacking and um, the bloody fighting that's been going on throughout the region. That, so that's his, his narrative and you see it very clearly in his, um, his statement, Adin Narod, Naf Segda, one people forever. Um, and you, he has posters and it's on signs and it's in the media and it's on the news and it's all through the occupied territories of southern Ukraine. Um, and these territories have been incorporated legally underneath Russian legal law, um, legal law, that's redundant, <laughs> underneath Russian law to bring these, these oblasts or regions into the Russian Federation. But he doesn't have ter full territorial control of those regions. And that's what he's attempting to do. He's attempting to move those borders uh, a little farther to the north, a little farther um, to the west to, to get to where that region there where it says Moldova, where there's a dotted line. To the right, that dotted line is a region called Transnistria. And to the south of it, where the opening is, in, in, and then go south to the Black Sea, um, up is Odessa. Mm on, on oh, the coast yeah. where the peninsula comes out. And that's what Putin has as his objective, I believe, is to have the entire uh, reaches of the Black Sea coast um, occupied by Russia and incorporated into the Russian Federation uh, so that Ukraine as a remnant becomes a landlocked country unable to get its grain to export uh, ports and so forth. What was he attempting to do? Did he, he made a play for Kiev at the onset of the war. This was probably to install a friendly regime, a puppet regime, or to take over all of Ukraine as in its entirety. Um, but Ukrainian special operations forces and conventional troops repelled effectively this attack. Weather and the terrain that is north of, of Kiev coming from southern, from where it says Belarus, coming down south to Kyiv, um, from the city of Golmel, then that highway that comes down, they got bogged down in the terrain, as we, is, is well known. And that, those factors contributed to Kyiv holding, and holding out, and Putin having to readjust his military objectives, I believe. Um, Dmitry Peskov, the speaker, um, the press secretary of, of the Russian Federation came out in within four to five weeks in an interview with Christian Amanpour of CNN and said that they were, re, they were not readjusting their military objectives, but these were their objectives all along and that it was a feint to go towards Kyiv. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, that's about as much uh, as, uh, as I give it as well. I, I think it's, it's comical. And these, these speakers um, like Peskov and uh, Sergei Lavrov, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, come out with statements that are just, they seem absurd to us, saying that the West started the war, that the West was to blame, and w we don't understand that. We don't understand where they're coming from. Why are they coming up with these, what we would call lies, 
but it has to do with the psychological dimension, the information, misinformation, and disinformation that's being leveled uh, as they attempt to, to frame the, the narrative in a certain way. And it's very effective domestically in Russia. Many people in Russia, according to reliable polls, are more anti-America than they are anti-Ukraine. As according to the latest poll, which came out just days ago from the Levada Center, thanks, Kevin. You bet. Um, Twelve percent is the popularity of the United States, where fifteen percent is the popularity of of Ukraine. Uh, China, eighty-seven percent of Russians have a positive opinion of the People's Republic of China. Uh, these are drastic shifts in national orientation that have taken place. Uh, finally, uh, I want to say one other thing here. Um, this last option I was talking about of, of trying to take all of Ukraine as a possibility of what Putin was attempting, um, I think that either was extremely naive to come up with that as a course of action, um, or it was based on really bad intelligence. Because while there are people in occupied Ukraine, in the Donbass region, in Zaporizhia, uh, in Herzen, um, in these oblasts in Crimea, who are happy to be reunited with the Russian Federation um, or the Union, there are many, many more people who will fight to the bitter end to not become part of the Russian Federation. And these are the people Kevin was talking about, this, this acrimony that exists. And it's palpable when you go over there. And I've spent time in Kharkiv, all the way to Kiev. I mean, of course, Kiev is how you get in and out of the country most of the time, um, to Lviv uh, and other parts, um, Zhytomyr, Gomel, other, other parts of Ukraine. And, and Belarus, and Russia, obviously, um, since that's my specialization is Russian defense studies. And these, these Ukrainians have a national identity, and, and Kevin was talking about that with the, the soldier who was bending down, kissing the colors of, of his new regiment. Um, they're there to fight. They're not going to, to give up and just roll over. Uh, like happened in Crimea during the unconventional warfare operation that took place there in 2014. And one Ukrainian soldier put it this way, it's not just about will, it's about fury, to be absolutely furious about the Russian attack and unprovoked invasion of the Ukrainian uh, state, um, trying to bring this independent country into what Russia calls its civilization hyphen country. That's coming from the most recent Russian national security doctrine that came out this spring. A civilization hyphen country. So they're, they're viewing themselves as something greater than a country that's approximating a civilization. Sounds to me like an empire. Um, sounds like fancy wording to, to get, get around calling it what it actually is, which is the Russian Empire uh, reinvigorated, rejuvenated. Finally, since um, I have a very close affiliation with special operations and being the editor of the Journal of Special Operations and Irregular Warfare, uh, I want to say a few words about irregular warfare and special operations. After all, this is referred to as a spetsoperatsia or spec op uh, in Russian as a special military operation, not a war though they slip from time again and refer to it as a war, though it's, it's not supposed to be referred to it as that. Um, the Russians are employing their special operations forces essentially as in Spetsnaz. Uh, Spetsnaz are their elite, semi-elite, I mean, some of them are even bailiffs in prisons um, and, and courts, um, but it just comes from Voyska Spetsyalna and Aznachenia, the word. Uh, Spetsnaz, um, this, which means special, special designation troops. And these Spetsnaz units, along with their SSO, their, their special operations forces that are under the command of the KSSO, their special operations forces command, these units are being used 
in very different ways than we typically use our special operations forces in the West and in the United States. They're being used as elite light infantry. Uh, they're being used alongside the Wagner Group, a private military corporation company, um, to go in and they, they send in the mobilized convicts from Wagner, send them, try to find weaknesses in the front lines. When they do find those weaknesses, they exploit them with their elite units. And those elite units then take the territory, but they don't hold it. They then turn it over to mainline frontline units. Um, and they go out and try to do the same thing again. Um, so that the value of life is attributed very differently to, to Wagner uh, convicts turned soldiers, to their elite soldiers that the Wagner, unit ha Wagner group has, to the Spetsnaz and SOF special operations forces that are there as part of the Russian Federation uh, military. And then they also conduct different operations such as strategic reconnaissance, uh, intelligence gathering, human intelligence for instance, covert and clandestine operations, as well as false flag operations. These are operations, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, uh, that are attempted to attribute to the adversary the, um, the, the action that, was that, was, that took place. And that leads us to the Novikovka Dam. Who did it? The Russians are saying that the Ukrainians did it. The Ukrainians are saying the Russians did it. Um, meanwhile, it's possible that it was a genuine explosion inside the dam, though probably unlikely. It's probably what we call a false flag operation, where the Russians did it not anticipating the full onset of consequences uh, that would, would occur um, because it's, un, it's not foretold how the water is going to flow once a dam is, is broken um, like that. And uh, I have no special insights into what's going on with the Novikovka Dam um, other than to kind of bring that to our minds. Was it a false flag operation? Was it a Ukrainian operation? Um, some people are saying the Ukrainians had something to gain with that. Uh, I find that hard to believe. I don't, I don't see any gains for the Ukrainian uh, military there. I, I believe it probably was a false flag operation on the Russian side. Um, but to wrap things up with the way I began, war is not something for Putin that he needs to end immediately. He's in this for the long haul, and he knows that he's, he's he has said, for instance, that the U.S. is going to fight into the last Ukrainian. You know, let that sink in for a second. What does that mean? That we're there to fight, but not, but through a proxy war, and that we will continue fighting as long as your Ukrainians there to, to do the fighting for us, um, and we will supply the weapons and materiel. Um, that's a pessimistic view of it, but it's not far from from the reality that we can observe at this point, because we don't want to escalate. We don't want to send U.S. forces, more U.S. forces into Ukraine. We don't want to spend, send U.S. forces to the front line or Western NATO forces to the front line, at least not yet. But the discussion is underway, of course, to have Ukraine join NATO sooner rather than later uh, to bring it under the NATO umbrella. And I will leave my comments there and remind us that the, the, the address is doldquestions at ku.edu. Uh, but first, I, I'd like to open, open the floor back to, to Kevin if he has any comments on what I've said or open the floor to the, to the audience. We've been talking a lot. We look forward to your questions because that's part of the other reason why we're here, to have the conversation. Uh, so, and let, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, one of the students will come to you with a microphone. Please ask your question, uh, and then Chris and I will answer it. So, and Attempt please, to. <laughs> yeah, okay. Here she comes. Oh, she'll hold it for you. Uh, <clears throat> you were talking about Putin actually using war as just a, a routine part of his, uh, his politics. Uh, 
when Putin came to power, there was the first Chechen war, uh, but then there was also uh, Transnistria, where it became a Florestan conflict, Nagorno-Karabakh, the invasion of Georgia, uh, the first invasion of, of Ukraine, uh, the war in Syria, and mm -hmm. Putin has used this over and over again, especially the taking of Crimea. Putin's popularity was going down because of economic problems in Russia before taking Crimea back, and he received a big boost from the, the quick victory over, over Ukraine and the retaking of Crimea. Uh, but there's never been any significant, or my opinion is there's never been any significant international pushback. Mm -hmm. So Putin essentially has been rewarded over and over again with domestic political popularity despite a lousy economy and violation of all of his campaign promises about boosting the Russian economy and fighting corruption. And do you agree that he's basically seen from every international conflict, he's seen rewards, he's benefited from it, and the pushback from other countries has just been weak or, or non-existent. And that would explain why he keeps doing these things. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so the book I'm finishing and will be published by Rutledge next year is called Putin at War. And it's, it, it's titled Putin at War from Chechnya to Ukraine. Um, and just to clarify your, your initial point, Putin was not in power. He was with the FSB while the first Chechen war was going on. That was 94 to 95. It was the second Chechen war um, that he, because he came to power in August as prime minister in August of 1999. Um, so the first, the, the first war that, that Putin was involved with was the second Chechen war, which was a qualitatively and quantitatively different war uh, than the first one. And so just straighten that out because each, everything you said is in my book as a chapter or a sub-chapter. Because <laughs> that's what my book is, is how it's laid out, is to look at even Syria. Um, Syria as the kind of location to gain experience for the Russian military to go in, get their soldiers battle-tested and battle-hardened and send them back to Ukraine or prepare them for the ongoing operation that's going on now. Now, the domestic push, um, whether or not that's a driver. The Russian economy under Putin did, re did rebound from the 2000s. Um, a matter of fact, it took until 2001, 2002 for the Russian economy to equal what it had been as the Russian Republic's economy of the Soviet Union during the Soviet era, if that makes sense, that specificity. Um, so it, it, the, the decline during the 90s of the economy was halted and the economy rebounded um, in the early 2000s. And then, of course, there's been difficulties, especially with sanctions that we've slapped on and the West has slapped on in general. But I agree with you that that's like a half-hearted measure. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to stop him. And when it comes to the risk calculus that is made by Putin when it comes to employing the milita military to achieve his strategic and political objectives, um, he, de he determines that that calculus is in his favor, that he will gain. And let's be frank, I mean, we're talking about trench lines. They might move a couple kilometers, maybe a couple hundred kilometers in one direction or another. But in the end, what's gonna happen to the territory that's being held by Russia? Are we, the West, going to say, let's negotiate for a end of hostilities here. And in which case, Putin will have a huge win. He'll have the entire regions of, or most of the, the regions or oblasts of Lugansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Herzen, um, hopefully on his part, hopefully, Mikhailov, um, and then Crimea. So these are huge victories for him. So yes, he's being rewarded, I think, by the, by the West. 
But let me wrap up by saying one thing. Uh, I talked to a general officer several years back after 2014, I think it was in 2016, and I said to him, we were discussing the war, and, and the topic came up of, of this, exactly what you're saying. Are we rewarding him? And he said, look, I, I don't want to send Western soldiers, American boys and girls, to fight to keep Russian-speaking people from joining the Russian Federation. Well, that's one thing when it comes to Crimea or when it comes to Lugansk and Donetsk. But what about Lviv, way out by Poland, by the D in Poland, actually south of there, um, south, 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 and then west. So over in that region, you just went east. <laughs> you're other west. <laughs> now you're good. Um, but Lviv is, is a western we town. We didn't rehearse that. So. <laughs> it's a western town, and it's um, dominated by Ukrainian speakers primarily, and it's, the, the tension there is palpable. They don't want to join the Russian Federation. Kiev doesn't want to join the Russian Federation. Um, so there's differences in different parts of the country. But just to shut up for a minute and let the, you guys get to have some time talking, um, I agree with, with your point and what you're saying. And I, um, I'm trying to lay that out in my book with hard evidence and fact. When the Russians started their invasion, <clears throat> they violated virtually every principle of war that you could violate. And that's one reason why they weren't successful. But here lately, it seems to me like one of the principles of war is unity of command. And this, this feud between the Russian general staff and the Wagner mm. commander is baffling to me because it disrupts the unity of command and I'm, I'm, what do you guys think about, how does he get away with this? I know he's an important and powerful person, but I'm surprised he hadn't fallen out of a six-story <laughs> window someplace. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't understand how he can get away with this. Is he, uh, is he a force that, that Putin can't control, or wh wh what's your opinion of that? You want me to take it? You can Go talk ahead. about the command Go ahead. Dim dimension, but um, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the owner of the Wagner Group. Um, yes, he started out selling hot dogs on the streets of St. Petersburg, but he is a very powerful man, and he has his own private army, and his private army is rather effective. And during the, the period from 2016 to 2021, when conscripts were coming in, or kontraktniki, we call them, the, the contract soldiers were coming into the, uh, the Russian army, they would get trained, some of them trained to Spetsnaz, some of them trained to Special Operations Forces. But the pay for the Wagner Group to go to places like Africa were six to eight times higher monthly to work for Wagner. So it's my own theory, supposition, if you will, that, and I've seen this in, in Russia, uh, playing out on Telegram and with Kontakti and <laughs> different social media sites, that Wagner has taken on the allure and the prestige of something like SEAL Team 6, that doesn't exist, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, you know, high-level Tier 1 Special Operations Forces. So, Prigozhin carries some, some real heft behind him, and it's taken some, some gall on his behalf to speak out against Putin on military affairs. Uh, he's not just speaking against, out against Gerasimov and Shoigu, uh, the, the battlefield commander and the, um, the Minister of Defense. He's speaking out against, against Putin as well. And I totally agree with you. I think we were, Kevin and I were talking about the, the sixth floor window of a hotel that he might slip and fall out of. Um, it's surprising he hasn't. And I think it says something that he hasn't. It might say that Putin's grip on power is weaker than we suspected. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it, it, le it lends credence to that um, conclusion. And I would also add that every time I've seen a picture of uh, Mr. Prigozhin, 
He's guarded by about 12 NFL-sized linebacker guys who are armed to the teeth. So, uh, you know, I imagine he's tough to get to, too. Yeah. Has the Ukraine operation helped or hurt Putin's uh, stature there? And has it weakened him or has it helped him regarding his position? And, and how stable is he? I think, so there's three questions there that are good. Um, I think it's helped him. I think it's hurt him. And I, I'm not sure how stable he is. I think his stability at this point is less than it was months ago. Um, it's helped him because he has created a narrative that has taken on a life of its own, uh, a narrative that the West started this. Um, you could say the West started it with NATO expansion into the Baltics. So the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were member states of the Soviet Union uh, and got independence in 1990 and 91. And we extended NATO ascension to them in 2004. And that's right on the heels of the Iraq invasion. And this is when Putin looked around him and said, America is going to war all over the world. It's not just in Afghanistan, but now it's in Iraq. And now NATO is at my doorstep and it's incorporating former Soviet republics. So former parts of Russia, if you will, because those territories were gained in 1703 against the Swedes. So these are territories that Russia considers Russian, even though they're not ethnic Russian. But again, Russia is not an ethnic nation state. It's a civilization hyphen country. And that's how Putin views it. And he, he views all 128 ethnic groups within Russia um, as being part of this greater Ruski Mir, or Russian world, if you will. Um, so I think, I think it's helped him more than it's hurt him uh, because the Russian people are willing to, to endure hardship for, uh, for defense, defensive means. And, defensive measures, and that's how Putin has framed this. And he is in such control of the media, social media at all levels, uh, and any dissident gets put in jail um, or flees the country or slips and falls out of a window. Uh, that, and even Western journalists are now in jail in the country, right? So um, I, I, think, I, I think it does help him shore up his grip on power, just how tight that grip on power is at this moment relative to the time of the start of the conflict, I can't say, but I suspect it's a little bit less. Uh, President Zelensky has some uh, uh, enormously important choices to make uh, right now as we speak, both strategically and operationally. Uh, the question is, uh, if uh, President Zelensky were to ask you uh, what's the best possible outcome he could achieve and how he should deploy to achieve it with the finite uh, forces available to him, uh, what would you tell him? What would you counsel him? So really two questions. What's the best uh, outcome he could realistically uh, pursue? And secondly, how should he deploy in order to uh, achieve that outcome? Just, just your opinion. President Zelensky is, is on uh, his made earlier statements saying that he realizes that wars end in negotiations. But of late, as we pointed out, it's been no all of Ukraine back under Ukraine control. He's going to have a, a, a heck of a time balancing that when it comes to how do we want to end this thing. If, if Kevin Benson were advising President Zelensky and his chief of defense staff, you know, what I would counsel would be to drive to the drive to the coast along the Sea of Azov, break the land bridge between the Donbas and Crimea, and dig in and hold that. Because that frustrates, that puts him in a very strong position because what is coming next year? More M1A1s, trained Ukrainian pilots with F-16s, the associated munitions that go with F-16s, and it puts them in a very powerful position because I know, I'm, I'm certain that the Ukrainian general staff is not going to culminate 
and go farther than they can support. And that's what I, if I was, if I was advising, that's what I would advise. Because I personally believe that when, whatever the outcome of this offensive that maybe started today, the Western nations are gonna to start to put pressure as much as they can on both sides to negotiate, especially if the Russians really lose big time. I don't know that that will happen. I suspect there's a greater possibility of that than you know, a slogging inch by inch World War I-like offensive and, and operations. And I'll bet you the Russians lose a lot of territory, but I think that they'll hold on to the, what were they, the, the, the line that the war started on in the Donbass with the rump states of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, I don't think the Ukrainians can take back, ben, Benson doesn't think the Ukrainians can take back Crimea barring a complete collapse of the Russian army. Not sure that that would happen. But that's what I would advise. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Okay. I agree. I have nothing to She's add. working her way around, folks. So, um, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. What's your, uh, what, do, what are your thoughts on why those haven't been used? And then early in the conflict, it seemed like if the more Putin was humiliated, the more likelihood that, that he would consider those types of options. So I'm just curious kind of why we haven't seen those. And are we closer to that nuclear line where we see him employing those types of weapons on the battlefield? Great question. Okay. Tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I think that the messaging that goes on between Western governments and Moscow are still going on. And the strong signals are, you know, the only people who've used nukes have been us against the Japanese near the end of World War II. And no one wants to see these, one, because the downwind hazard area of the nuclear weapons is Western Europe, because that's the way the prevailing winds go. And I think that's a part of the, I think that's part of the calculus that if we blow not just one, because one isn't gonna do anything for him. You know, I submit he'd use 10, 12, 14 to truly get the nuclear effect. But all of that blows toward Western Europe and does that trigger Article 5 of the NATO Convention? Maybe. So I think that's, that is in itself is a deterrent effect. Now, I also have not read anything about, because you know, I remember training in, in uh, maximum uh, operational protective posture for, for long hours, you know, mask, chemical suits, all of that, and inside my tank, and trying to figure out how we would fight under nuclear conditions or post-nuclear conditions. I've not seen anything that indicates the Russian army has done anything like that. Maybe they have, but the other part of the calculus Benson believes is you know, that the Russian general staff's going, you know, we talk about this all the time in our staff college, but we haven't trained on it, we haven't practiced our troops, Chances are it would shock their own troops just as much. You know, the first time gas was used in World War I, it worked really great against the French until the wind shifted and it blew back on the Germans and they panicked just as much. You know, end result, no gain. So I mean, I think those are all the things that go on. That's why I think we haven't seen them. And I don't think Mr. Putin is desperate enough yet. Uh, you know, if there is a huge collapse of the Russian army, uh, and it looks like the Ukrainians are going to cross into Russia in not just you know, free Russian, you know, free Russian uh, units, but organized Ukrainian units crossing into, into Holy Mother Russia. Well, then maybe. Then maybe Kiev gets an unscheduled sunrise. But I don't, I don't, that's why I don't think we've seen them. I really don't. It, just pragmatically, I darn sure hope everyone's thinking about what if and how do we, what do we do? And I, I'd like to think that some of my former students in the Pentagon and other places are, are doing stuff like that. They're thinking about what if and how do we respond. Nuclear weapons are a political weapon, even though the, even though the Russians differentiate between tactical and strategic. 
The West does not. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thanks for asking. I know you're being patient, sir. This young lady is working like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to hold it, huh? Uh, I can't stand up. But uh, uh, I wonder, we hear every day about the counteroffensive and what it may be going on right now, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering what effect the, uh, the bridge, I, I mean, the, um, yeah, the dam being, being blown, does that have any relationship to where they might start their offensive at all? Oh, absolutely, sir. Absolutely. This is a, if you're looking at this very coldly, this is a pragmatic use of, of what we call counter mobility. Every area, I mean, all the areas downstream of that dam are now impassable for everyone. And so the Ukrainians can't really attack through there. And they might get small boats of, of infantry, but nothing substantial is going to go. So in one fell swoop, it reduces the amount of frontage that the Russian army uh, has to be concerned about. Uh, you know, the probing attacks will still go on, and there can still be weakness, weak points developed, but, you know, just from a cold-hearted, ruthless view, uh, the advantage of this dam being blown, how, whatever happened, I think it's to the Russians, and it, it materially helps them in their defense. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, the Ukrainians are going to get weapons from a variety of sources, the United States, uh, France probably, United Kingdom, uh, Germany. Uh, does this variety of sources pose any problems for integrating these weapons into the Ukrainian uh, force? D training and, you know, who gets what? Sir, great. Yes. I think it does. Uh, I'm one of, in my back and forth banter with some of my friends, I, I say that the, probably the toughest job in the Ukrainian army is the supply officer and the maintenance officer because he's got to worry about spare parts for British vehicles, French vehicles, German vehicles, American vehicles, British, American vehicle, uh, vehicles of American manufacture that came from the Norwegians and German manufacture that came from the Norwegians. The, there's supposedly standard NATO agreements for ammunition, but from what I've read, artillery rounds that fit into an American 155 millimeter howitzer won't fit into the German Panzer Haubitze 2000, and they don't fit into the French Caesar uh, 155 artillery system, so there's different kinds of ammunitions. What I'm sure we will see as the, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian offensive unfolds is that there will be organized units of Ukrainians solely in British vehicles, solely in German vehicles, solely in French vehicles, uh, because that would make it somewhat easier for the supply, resupply, and maintenance uh, aspects. So you focus a group on training just on that system, training on another one. That's why I said in my opening comments, I think that one of the, the risks in the truest sense of that word that the Ukrainians took was taking advantage of the focus on Bakhmut and taking brigades off the line and getting them trained by the Brits and the French and the Americans uh, to build those kind of organizations. The combination of all of that, the effect of those different brigades, from what I understand, they're all fighting on, under what they've learned from the various nations, but we all have, again, in Europe, the standard NATO agreements, so combined arms, the use of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and artillery uh, is pretty much the same. It is just the effect of those different weapon systems that is somewhat different. But I think the end result would still be the same. But warfare is all about logistics too. And, and yeah, I think it's gonna be really hard for the Ukrainians to manage that. But great point, sir, great point. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we have a few questions from online. Um, Tanner Brock has a question asking, Kevin mentioned learning from this war. He shared his perspective of lessons that can be learned from this war, particularly from a tactical preparation perspective. From a civilian perspective, what should we be learning from this war in terms of preparation? Thank you. Uh, Kevin Benson personally believes that it is far too early, even at 16 months of war, to draw any kind of ultimate conclusion and lesson learned. I do believe that operations and tactics that have been seen can be folded into our, our, our army in particular, the uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that we put out to, fee to units in the field. Uh, just from a general observation as a soldier, what I see reinforced, frankly, is you know, the fact that everybody needs to really know how to use their first aid kit because you know, the Ukrainians are taking a real pounding from Russian artillery. And so every soldier needs how to bandage wounds. I mean, that's really fundamental and really low level, but it's really important. You know, our army learned that in Iraq with all the IEDs. I mean, you know, we, we remember that stuff. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is the fact that, boy, we really be able, ought to be able to, must be able to maintain our own equipment. Uh, again, tactical level, the importance, though, of you know, when there's a halt, you know, check your tank treads, check the ammunition. Is there dirt that's going to clot it? Small things like that that are reinforced, not so much lessons learned, but things that we know we should do are now suddenly much more important and they're reinforced. For my neighbors, uh, you know, in my little cul-de-sac, I am the only retired soldier. And you know, what should we know? Well, you know, and I, I, honest to God, I tell them this, that war, you know, all, all you guys from Staff College, you know what I'm gonna say, war is an extension of policy by other means. We as citizens, we as voters, need to know about what are the policies that our government is following. And we need to communicate to our elected representatives our views on those policies and, and make Jake LaTurner and Doc Marshall and Jerry Moran to explain to us what's going on. And if they don't like it, what are they doing to change things? And, and, not, and not just, you know, hand-waving. No, talk to me, Doc, in pragmatic, step-by-step -step things that you are going to do. Because that's our responsibility as voters, I would, I would say. We need to be involved. Uh, my friend Corey Shackey, uh, in an interview, said that this is the, one of the best investments of U.S. defense funds ever for 5% for of the defense budget the Ukrainians are destroying the Russian army. Like, well, that's kind of cold and pragmatic view. But those are our policy objectives that the president announced in March of last year. You know, who knows what those are? I do. We need to pay attention. That's what I would say. That's what I always say to my, my civilian neighbors who then want to talk about the chiefs or the royals. Because so. <laughs> it's like, Kevin, you're just, you're hurting my head. You're making me angry, angry or sad. It's like, okay, let's have another beer. But, but that's what I would say. I, I really would. There are pragmatic, practical things from the individual soldier level to higher level staffs that I know our army is studying. And I know those, le those observations are being reinforced through the way we write our doctrine to the way we teach in our staff college. I know that's happening. Uh, and for our, and what I said, for the rest of us who are you know, informed and interested citizens of our country, what is being done in our name by our government, both the legislative and the executive branch? How about that? Is that okay? Tanner, Tanner will probably tell me, so. 
He'll, he's going to grade my grammar and, and everything else, too. Thank you for that. So we have another one from online. Thomas, Thomas Searle asks um, to both speakers, we were all surprised by the poor performance of the Russian military during the initial invasion, but what have been the biggest surprises for you since you got over that shock? You want to go first? You go first. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> uh, first off. Tom is another one of those guys who's going to grade our answer. So. Yeah. So it was an initial shock. Um, after the invasion of Crimea and seeing troops line up and rip their Ukrainian army patches off their uniform and stand in, at attention while Russian forces came on onto their, their bases, when we, we saw 2022 happen, February 24th, 25th, 26th, the initial days of the attack, um, analysts were coming out saying this is going to be, you know, the Russians themselves thought it was going to be an 11-day operation, we, we found out. We thought it was going to be somewhere in that as well. Um, so it was an initial shock. But after that, the, the will, resilience, um, and skill of the Ukrainian army is, I think, something that was not a shock, but a, a very good surprise. Um, we had done a lot of work, we being the, the, the United States and the West, um, in helping at, at the Staff College train through IMET, international officers from Ukraine, through the MOTA program to train staff officers and ministers of, of defense and uh, assistance and like DASD levels and stuff like that. And to see that they were able to use NATO doctrine, Western concepts, and understand the battle through that perspective, I think was a good surprise um, and one that gave us hope that the Ukrainians could, could stand and fight against these 10 foot tall Russians that in fact weren't 10 feet tall. Um, and I think, I think that would be my answer to Tom, but I'm sure Kevin has an answer. I was, and our, our friend Tom knows this, and, and you read the little bio. I, I was a professional soldier for 30 years. My focus was the study of warfare uh, for 30 years, and then and afterwards, too, because I had the privilege of teaching soldiers. Uh, I was surprised at the depth of the ineptitude of the Russian general staff, uh, but I was not surprised that they rather quickly overcame it. Uh, and that I was not surprised that the Russians were learning just as quickly as the Ukrainians. All the Ukrainians started with an edge. Uh, the observations, though, that I would draw were, and you saw it on the, on the, the rolling chart that we had, uh, war is never straightforward, power is not based solely on weapons, and national identity has military value. And the surprising aspect is that we sadly have to relearn those lessons uh, and the toll that it takes on people. Uh, that was kind of surprising to me, even though having being the proud owner of a KU history PhD, uh, I know that surprise is always going to happen because we don't like to think about unpleasant things like war. You know, we leave that to guys like me and my, my colleagues here who still teach at the Staff College or teach at the National Defense University because that's what we do. But that's, that's uh, I would answer him. And I know Tom will let me know how I did. <laughs> Yes, uh, hello. Uh, I'd, I'd like to make one comment before I ask a question. And that was, uh, remember you were talking about the general officer who was saying, why should we uh, send American uh, youth to defend uh, or help the Ukrainians keep the Russians. Russian speakers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Russian speakers yeah. under Ukrainian control? Yeah. And I thought, well, during this war, we've seen a lot of Russian speakers 
who have said, I'm not going to speak Russian anymore mm -hmm. because of what Putin has done. That's right. Also, that same kind of thinking was on display in 1938 when you had Excuse Hitler me. saying, whoa, these German speakers in Czechoslovakia belong to me. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, uh, the uh, British prime minister and the French, you know, leader agreed that, oh, we wouldn't want to fight Hitler to uh, keep German speakers under Czech control. So, I mean, it's like, you know, what do people learn from history? If, if appeasement worked, you know, well, yes, good, but it doesn't work. And so this is the thing with uh, talking about Hitler and uh, Putin. But anyway, my question was, you had the uh, uh, slide up there showing the uh, HIMARS. And when the HIMARS artillery system was introduced, it really helped the Ukrainians. It, it, they blasted a lot of Russian supply depots and other things. And I think it helped set the stage for some successful operations in the fall. We now have had how many months of people advocating the uh, supply of ATACMS. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the British now are finally saying, okay, enough of allowing Crimea to be a sanctuary base for the Russians to launch missile attacks and drone attacks against the Ukrainians. And so the, the British are leading now on giving the longer range missiles to the Ukrainians. And, for, and what's the U.S. doing? Uh, we're still doing nothing as far as supplying the ATACMS. And I was just, you had mentioned uh, saying to uh, our Senator Marshall, okay, Doc Marshall, what are you doing concretely to do X and X and X to support Ukraine or whatever? And I was just kind of curious of asking you two gentlemen if you could say what you have been doing concretely within your system of networks within the national security system to get people advocating, so we finally get ATACMS to uh, Ukraine. Thank you. Can I comment first on that? Go ahead. And then I'll hand it over. Go ahead. Uh, so just to clarify, um, I totally agree with you with the Sudetenland analogy. Um, I don't believe we can appease Putin. Putin has to be defeated. He has to be clearly defeated, and that probably will end his political career, and so be it. And good riddance, um, but I think the attackums is part of that, that scenario, as are the F-16s. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin. I just wanted to clarify that point, that I wasn't in agreement. I was just reporting what this general officer had said. Oh, okay. yes, okay. but I mean, yeah. it's that kind of thinking that is too prevalent exactly. within the you know, higher echelons, and, you, and we should know better. I, I mean, right? I, mean, I that, think you should know better. I mean, what, I don't yeah. know what his education was, but he should have, Obviously, he didn't have much of a basis of understanding past history. Yeah. Kevin. <clears throat> so, war is an extension of policy through other means. The policy objectives, in particular, Russia paying a heavy price for its actions, thus sending a message to other would-be aggressors that they cannot seize territory and subjugate other countries. I mean, that's one of the four. Uh, our country has to balance. Now, that, that may be hard to say. I understand that. The caveat on, that our country has given the Ukrainians that they've accepted is that you can't use our weapons to attack into Russia. We think that is a bridge too far. You can pound Russians everywhere they are in your country. But Crimea is occupied Ukrainian right. territory. But the, the specific system you're talking about, the Army Tactical Missile System, uh, has a range that would allow the Ukrainians to launch into Russia at legitimate military targets, yes, but into Russia. And so that's a policy decision. But the could do No. Uh, yeah, but that's not where they're being used. 
they're, they're being used where they can get the most effect at their maximum effective range of about 50 miles. So the Ukrainians, are, I think, are being very clever at using the systems that they have to the maximum effect that they can. The fact that the British government and the French government took a policy decision to give the Ukrainians the storm shadow uh, cruise missile with a range of, I'm looking at you, Jeff, but I know you don't know the answer. I think it's uh, 160 miles, 200 miles, uh, which allows them to strike in Ukraine, oh, excuse me, into Crimea, is probably the result of government. The government talks about we've got to do something uh, because Storm Shadow is only launched from aircraft, and Storm Shadow is only launched from specific aircraft, so there's a limited number of Ukrainian aircraft that can launch that system, whereas ATACMS can, is just a pod that you can put on any, any uh, HIMARS launcher or mobile launch rocket system launcher and go wherever. It, it's, this is one of those hard, pragmatic policy decisions. Believe me, we have, in the, the little circles I'm in, we have lots of debates on should it be there, should it not. Personally, I think it's a wise decision that it's not yet. Um, because, again, here's another card that we can hold that now it's leverage going into negotiations when the diplomats are talking and say, well, look, you know, if you're not willing to bend, if you're not willing to give this up, you know, the Ukrainians have wanted this ATACMS and, you know, suddenly you know, we've got an awful lot of them in Western Europe that are really easy to ship. So do you want to have that effect? I, I'm, I'm spitballing. I don't know that that happens. That would be my inclination. I think it's a wise choice right now. I mean, last year I said it. Is, is Chicago worth Kiev? And, and I, no, I don't think so. And the Russians remind us that they've got nuclear weapons too. Um, I know, it, it's hard, but I think this is the, the hardball thing that goes on. I really do. Oh, she's back in the corner. Uh, he, he's got to be next because he's been real patient. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, after, I'm just saying next. Kevin, this is a question for you. If my memory is correct, you're an old tank jockey, aren't you? Yes, I am. Okay. The idea of driving down towards the sea, how much, uh, we, we've seen what happened to the planes and the, and the uh, tanks that the Russians had, and I'm sure you didn't want to be in any of their tanks for a while there. Right. Question is, what would it take to be able to hold that and not to lose all our tanks and the Ukrainians' tanks and, and planes and um, be able to make that a manageable mm -hmm. position from which to negotiate? Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that as a, as a person who's been in that territory? Well, it's been a while since I've actually studied detailed maps that low level of from Zaporizhia, did I pronounce it right? Yeah. Uh, all the way down to the, the coast and near the Sea of Azov. Uh, the Ukrainians are attacking in the spring and in the summer. The ground is going to support uh, heavy mechanized movement and, and wheeled vehicle movement off-road. So I think that will give an advantage once, the, once a front is penetrated uh, to some point. And then what it takes to hold is what it's going to, like I said, the ebb and the flow. It's going to take a really tough defense, and they're going to have to dig in positions and build strong points and have a mobile defense. Then I'm pretty sure, just looking at the way the Ukrainians have trained and fought, that they really know how to do. Uh, it will split Russian forces, uh, and it would also, I think, shock them that they'll want to hold Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula, uh, and what will be more important when those, when those two areas are split is to hold on to what they have, uh, that if the, the effect of a successful operation as it spreads into Russian units kind of unsettles them as well. But I think that's what it would take, I really do. The F-16s aren't gonna be available until sometime next year because and it's, it's not that the Ukrainians are 
you know, can't fly those things. It's, it's a different system. You know, my Air Force buddies tell me it's going to take about a year to really, and it's not only to learn how to fly, it's learn how to fly effectively, use, learn how to use the weapons that are associated with that aircraft, the maintenance personnel to take care of it, the supply system to be established to not only get spare parts for the airplanes, but to sustain the flow of munitions and gas, aviation fuel, to keep that aircraft flying. So next year it would help the defense when those aircraft show up, I believe. Thanks for being patient, sir. Yeah, sure. Can Crimea be taken absent an air or sea assault? Yes. Really? <laughs> However, you know, you just look on, on, on the, uh, that, that side of your map, that, that one there. There is a very tiny ith, God, I always screw that. Isthmus. Isthmus. Uh, or it maybe it doesn't show well enough. Uh, and so that, boy, that would, be, that would be a really hard nut to crack. I've, one of the things Chris and I talked about, I saw some satellite imagery that was published in papers, and I thought, oh, maybe we should put those pictures in our presentation, but they didn't, you know, when you cut it out of a newspaper and then you put it into a PowerPoint and then you try to blow it up so you can see it, they just, you know, it's like, it was like me without my glasses on. I, you know, I think it's a picture, but I don't know what it is. But the defenses there that I've seen just from open source satellite imagery are so in depth and it, there's just no way to maneuver. This would be a punch him in the face and then when that hand gets broken, bring another hand in and punch him in the face. That would be really hard. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't spend my army that way. Uh, but then a seaborne assault, I've also seen satellite photos, again, it was in the New York Times, of what the seaside, the coastline of Crimea looks like. Uh, again, the Russians know how to defend. Uh, I'm not saying that the soldiers might not stand, but the physical defenses with dragon's teeth and wire and mines and other obstacles are so dense that it would, it would really be hard. And I don't know that the, the Ukrainians have that kind of navy and that kind of, those kind of specialized craft to assault a defended beach. Uh, I sure wouldn't want to be a paratrooper in the air defense systems that are there to jump out of, a, of an airplane. It may be safer jumping out of the airplane, uh, but a lot of those might get shot down on the way in. So, I mean, that, the Crimea would be really tough. How would, that, how would that break? If the Russian army folds. And, and see, there again, that's why I think the information operations that are going on in the mind games of Russian soldiers and Russian commanders is so important, just like the, the Russians are doing to the Ukrainians. I mean, a common story I've heard is a Russian calling a Ukrainian officer's mom saying, I'm in your son's unit. Boy, he was just terribly wounded. You know, he'd love to hear your voice. And mom calls her son, who's perfectly healthy in, in a position, and now the Russians know exactly where he is and where his position is. I've heard the same story being applied against the Russians. Uh, mind games are going on, and you know, maybe that helps too. But it would be one heck of a bloody fight, I think. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do it. Sir, wait, where'd you go? Oh, thank you. I was looking at my, my watch. I beg your pardon. Um, can folks online still send you questions? So, folks, if you're watching live stream, dole questions at ku.edu. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks. I hope we've been informative. Chris? Thank you. Just thank you for the, for the uh, attention and for the questions and for the opportunity for reflection on what it is that we do and study. And um, we come away from these things smarter and with greater insight than when we show up. So thank you for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.